first of all, thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed for coming to join us. We appreciate it, so thank you. You're welcome. Let's start off, what is Twistronics? So Twistronics is the ability that we have you know, of the past decade or so to change the angle between two crystalline structures, between two atomic planes. That's something that was not possible in the history of material science until 2D materials came to be. And then people realized that that tunability, that possibility of changing this twist angle is something that you know, was very unusual, you know, people had not thought of. And when they started calculating things, they realized that it could lead to very unusual electronic changes in the properties of the materials. What kind of changes? The energy of the electrons changes and how the electrons behave changes. So initially they didn't know very well how would that manifest in experiments. But then a few years ago, with experiments that showed that the modification of the electronic properties can be very dramatic. A material which is not superconductor can turn into a superconductor. A material that is not an insulator can turn into an insulator. And all of this depends on minute changes in the angles between these two lattices. So it's really, it caught everybody by surprise. And, 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 and here's now a lot of people are working on it. Give me an example. So the first and, and, and most famous example is magic angle twisted by layer graphene. That's a little bit of a mouthful. So you have a graphene sheet, which is a one atom thick sheet of carbon atoms. And then you put another graphene sheet on top and you twist the two sheets by an angle of 1.1 degree. It has to be quite precise. You know, that angle 1.1 degree is called ma the magic angle. So graphene, which itself is a semi-metal, it's not an insulator and it's not a superconductor. When you put these two pieces of graphene on top of each other at this angle of 1.1 degrees, at this magic angle, we can turn it into a superconductor or an insulator. And that's something that was pretty extraordinary. People did not anticipate in, in, and it's one of the most remarkable examples of how putting two things together at an angle changes the properties of the constituent layers. How did you get into the whole field? Well, I had this intuition that using this angle degree of freedom, because it was completely new, it had to give something interesting, you know. If usually when you explore uncharted territory, you always find some nice surprises, at least in, in my field in condensed matter physics. So we started to work on these twisted structures. In addition, there, were some, there was some theoretical work that had predicted some of those changes in the electronic structure is called of the, of the material, the, you know, the, you know we didn't know, and, and theory didn't know, that this could turn into superconductors, insulators, and so on. But certain changes were predicted. Right. And in particular, the most profound changes seemed to happen at that magic angle. So there was already some uh, guidance, some orientation that, that uh, exploring these small angles would actually be quite interesting. Your latest discovery, ability to turn superconductivity on and off with a short uh, electric pulse, what impact can that have? So this is something where we're beginning to mix different types of behaviors that materials can have, okay? So for example, there is a type of materials called ferroelectrics, and these ferroelectrics have an electric dipole moment, which is, is, is something that um, points in a given direction. And in ferroelectrics, you can make it point up or down, and you can switch it, okay? So ferroelectric materials are being investigated as a possible use in all kinds of memory applications, and in particular also in neuromorphic uh, computing applications. Yeah. Now, separately from that, we have superconductors, which are materials with zero resistance, and materials that you can sometimes gradually turn on and off the superconductivity. A handful of materials, you can do that, okay? Now, what we could not do before is change the behavior of a superconductor abruptly, like a switch, you know, in a, dis, you know, in a sort of bistable state. That's something that would be a superconductor ferroelectric, for example. And that's something that um, didn't exist before. Now we have this possibility to turn electrically and very abruptly a superconductor between two, you know, on and off states, you know, or basically superconducting and resistive state or superconductor and insulated states. So for now, as a piece of basic physics, it's a new type of behavior and a new type of control. We do not know exactly, you know, what will it lead to in terms of applications, but given the fact that 
superconductors are being heavily investigated both for basic science and for applications. For example, superconducting memories, superconducting quantum computing, all kinds of things like that. And that ferroelectrics are also being very heavily investigated for applications in neuromorphic computing. It is conceivable that perhaps having a superconductor ferroelectric might be useful for perhaps for neuromorphic computing, which is done in, at low temperatures for, for superconducting electronics or something like that. So we don't know yet, it's very early, but I think that you know, it, it, it will take just some creative engineers to now figure out what to do with it. You were talking about Tristronics, and, uh, and you said a lot of people are working on Tristronics at, at, at the moment, exciting area. What are some of the challenges facing Tristronics right now, and, and, and how do you see those being overcome? So there are several challenges. The, the first work in Tristronics was done with graphene, graphene on graphene, and now we put many layers and we can vary the angles. Graphene is a little bit of a special material because it's relatively inert. And hence, when we make these devices, which we make at room temperature in ambient conditions, it, you know, each graphene sheet does not degrade as we're making these Tristronic devices. We have hundreds and hundreds of atomic, you know, or, or you know, ultra thin materials that we can twist and make Tristronics with. But many of those other materials are very sensitive to atmospheric degradation. So it is a challenge to make as high quality Twistronic devices with other materials as we do with graphene. It is possible and people are working on it by working in special environments, but that's one challenge. The other challenge that we have is that the electronic, optical, mechanical properties of these Twistronic devices are extremely sensitive to the precise value of the twist angle. And we don't know yet how to control down to 0.001 degree how to assemble these structures, but, but the properties can change in that small increments. Yeah? In addition, when we fabricate these devices, because these are very thin devices, imagine this is like putting plastic wrap on top of plastic wrap, and we have to make sure there's absolutely no wrinkle, no nothing, you know. So the twist angle has to be homogeneous over the entire device, and that is something also which is quite challenging. There is typically something called twist angle disorder, small misorientations, of the two graphene lattices or the two 2D material lattices that we are putting on top of each other. And those, you know, we would like to control to make sure they have an absolute uniform twist angle over the entire structure to characterize at a more fundamental level all these devices. A lot of work to do. Yes. <laughs> so, so your work in Twistronics, how, how do you think twist, the work in Twistronics will impact broader condensed matter physics? So what Twistronics and not just Twistronics, there is, you know, this, the Twistronics is one aspect of something that we call moiré quantum matter. Sometimes you can get similar effects without twisting, but by putting materials which have different lattice constants. Because the idea is that you form a long wavelength or a, or a spatially periodic, super periodic modulation of the material. So it has turned out to be an extremely useful and tunable platform to investigate what we call correlated physics or strongly, strongly interacting quantum matter. Right. Yeah? So it turns out that the, you know, many of the most fascinating states of matter that we have in the universe are states of matter where the particles interact very strongly. This happens after the Big Bang, it happens in neutron stars, it happens in all kinds of areas of physics. And in particular in condensed matter physics, which is one where many, many thousands of physicists are working on, this is something that when the electrons interact very strongly, they produce very unusual phenomena and phases of matter. For example, superconductors, for example, ferromagnets, for example, topological you know, materials. We, are, we have been able to realize pretty much all of those phases of matter using this Twistronics platform. And we have a lot of tuning knobs to investigate their properties, which you don't have with traditional quantum materials. Right. So it's something which some people um, make it a little bit analogous to the quantum simulators that people used with cold atom lattices, where they have exquisite control over all the parameters of the system. We don't have as much control, but we can do that in a you know, condensed matter platform much more simply, and, and, and we have quite a, bit, quite a bit of tunability, and we've been able to explore many phases which they haven't been able to simulate yet with ultra-cold atoms. So it is an extremely rich platform that I think is going to, I mean, it's already teaching us a lot about systems of strongly interacting particles, and I think it will, you know, it, it will only grow. 
It's an exciting time to be a physicist, isn't it? I mean, you know, we've done a lot of interviews today and, and we get the feeling that we're on the cusp of a lot of big discoveries in a lot of uh, areas because of the ability with uh, new abilities with data and new abilities to interrogate the data and the, the things that you're talking about here. What advice would you give to a young physicist who's just uh, starting out? And, and, and why do you think the, the, the work that you do would be a good area for a young physicist to enter into? Mm -hmm. I think that as a, as a young physicist, I, I would give a, a couple of pieces of advice. One is more general, regardless of what they do. I would encourage people to take risks and be adventurous, okay? Of course, it's much easier said than done, especially for me, you know, a tenure professor. But I think that the biggest surprises are usually in areas which are underexplored. Yeah? So I would encourage people to be brave, take risks, and, 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 and try to look for, explore and look for things in areas where very little has been done or, or areas, you know, regions of parameter spaces where people haven't looked at, because I think interesting surprises will happen there. That's something which happened when we uh, investigated Twistronics. There was almost nobody working on it a few, you know, five years ago, and now it's thousands of people. In particular, in the field of, you know, Twistronics and this more quantum matter, when you're a young person, it's very exciting when you see that a field is vibrant, that a lot of people are interested. There are constantly theoretical predictions appearing about what could happen. So. You have plenty of opportunity to talk to people. You come to conference like the March meeting and there are many sessions on Twistronics, which means you can talk to a lot of people. So there's a lot of excitement. And I think that's something that is very, very attractive for a young person to start. You know, you're very motivated. Of course, this also means there's a lot of competition. So you have to, you know, and, and hence you have to be careful. You know, you can compete with everybody on something which is clear where to go or you can try to be a bit more exploratory where there's less competition, but of course there's more risk because you are not sure, <laughs> no guarantee of success. So I think that that's, you know, that's a game that depending on each person, how comfortable, what's the risk tolerance, you know, you put your savings in the bank or in the stock market or in bitcoins, you know, well, <laughs> different people have different levels of risk tolerance, you know, but in any case, it's a very exciting area and, 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 and people are generally very happy. They can interact with a lot of people. They can travel to many places, meet a lot of people that are working on it. So it's very exciting. Thanks very much. I really appreciate that. Thank you.